Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. There we go. <laughs> um, this week we are in Torah portion, Baha. And I'd like everyone to imagine a world with me, okay? Before we get into this, I'd like everyone to get the imagination caps on, mm -hmm. all right? Because in this world, what we're going to imagine now, every 50 years, all financial debt, no matter how big, it is will be wiped okay it'll be wiped for you it'll be wiped for your family it'll be wiped for your loved ones all mortgages bank loans car finance contracts money you owed other people you felt indebted to money you owed loved ones in this world all that stress goes all debt gets wiped every 50 years okay and in this world it's the law so there's no loopholes there's no you owe me after these 50 years. No, it's done. It's the law. Okay. And in this world, in the 50th year, you also didn't have to work. You didn't have to work for a whole year. It was a year of complete rest. And not only that, all your needs would be provided for in that year. Your food. In fact, you'd have an abundance of food. Your home would be provided for a whole year off work. Can you imagine it? You know, people in this country go mad when they get a, 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 a day off in a year when it's the Queen's Jubilee. You know, so this, in this world, every 50th year, you'll get a whole year off, you know, and on top of that, families would actually be reunited in this world. So not, no matter how far away they will be, your families will come together. And it will be a great celebration for an entire year. You would see your neighbours, they wouldn't be caught up in work, you'd have time to spend with your friends, you know, no one would have commitments of work, so everyone could make it, okay? And remember your shelters provided for, so could you imagine the parties that would take place in this world, the get-togethers that you would have during this year? This in the Bible is known as the Jubilee year, and it is commanded to take place every 50 years. And what we're about to read in this Torah portion this week is a biblical prescription. It's an inoculation against environmental and social problems, solving habitat destruction, soil nutrient loss, hunger, overwork, unabated growth, wealth gaps, monopolization. This 50th year solves disconnects between people and their food, people and the earth, people and animals, people and their neighbors, it's a reset done right. Not the great reset at the cost of the poor, but a godly reset affecting mostly those who have the most. I know, could you imagine it? You know, hey bro, next year's it's the Jubilee, you know? And you get excited about it, you know? Could you imagine saying to your friends, hey, the Jubilee's coming off, we're gonna get a year off work, we're gonna have some parties, we're gonna relax, we're gonna have an abundance of food. Could you imagine the hope it would bring? Oh, sister, I know you've been struggling at work, but just hang in there. The Jubilee's just two years away. You know, don't worry about it. I know you've got all that debt for 10 years, but keep working hard. You know, you're going to be freed. We're going to have, have a whole year off. I know your work's tough, but hang in there. The Jubilee's coming up. In Hebrew, the Jubilee is called the Yovel the year of release or the year of liberty. And we're just going to look at one chapter or one chapter and two verses this week. So it's a tiny, tiny Parsha. And we're going to be looking at the physical and spiritual applications of the Yovel, of the Jubilee for us today. And most importantly, searching for Yeshua inside of the Jubilee. So the title of this Torah portion, as you can see on the screen, is Baha. And it's practically one, cha one chapter. So if you can all... Turn to your Bibles, please, for Leviticus 25. And if you don't have a Bible, that's no problem. You can just listen along. And as you turn into Leviticus 25, I'm just going to read our creed out aloud. Um, and this is from 1 Corinthians 13. And it's, Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, love does not boast. Love is not puffed up, love does not seek its own, is not provoked, reckons not the evil, Love does not rejoice over the unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love covers all, believes all, expects all, endures all. 
Love never fails. Hallelujah. So the Torah portion title, Baha. I'm going to hand it over to my brother Tommy. If you could, could you give us a little bit of an insight, please, of what that means in English. Yeah, certainly, bro. Um, <clears throat> it's quite short and sweet, really. It's nothing too elongated. Um, Baha, or some, some say Baha Sinai, um, referring to Sinai, Mount Sinai. That this word Baha, it's two words into one, really. The the heart means mount or mountain, basically a big hill, um, and the the letter B in English, which would be the bait, bait in the Hebrew. As we know with Hebrew letters, they can mean a multitude of things. You know, like the letter bait could be, ah, it looks it was originally the, in the paleo of the shape of a tent, mm. so it's someone's home, it's a house, it's yeah. a household. It can even refer to family. It's the second letter, so it can be the number two. Mm. It's also a preposition, um, so it can be on, at, in, etc. You know, it's very, it's mostly it's in, but here it's on, so it's on the uh, Mount Sinai, Baha Sinai. Um, mountains in scriptures are quite synonymous with, with God, or at least God's presence. You know, um, and we know that Mount Sinai is called the Mountain of God. We see that in Exodus, don't we? And we also see in the, in Isaiah how uh, the Temple Mount in in Jerusalem is referred to as the Mountain of God. You know, it reminds us of Moses who went up to the Father on them at Mount Sinai, and it reminds us of Yeshua who went up to the Father. You know, it's it's quite symbolic, um, a mountain scripturally. And if you think of Psalm twenty four, King David says, "Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in His holy place?" Mm. You know, because this is um, this is what we want. Uh, we need to know how to approach our God, and it's only through Yeshua that we we are we can. He makes it, he makes it possible. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Wow. So that's our target. Um, so yes, yeah, short and sweet. Baha. Thanks, brother. On the mount. And this commandment of the jubilee, it's actually given from Mount Sinai, isn't it? It's a commandment from Mount Sinai, just like the Ten Commandments, so it does show the seriousness of the commandment. But before we read about the Jubilee year in the Torah portion, we come across the sabbatical year, and this sabbatical year is like a mini Jubilee that happens every seven years, okay? So even better, you know, we've just been talking about the 50 years here, year off work, all the rest of it. Well, in this community, there's there's, there's, a, there's a mini jubilee every seven years, so to speak, and known as the sabbatical. So just some technicalities before we read the Parsha. We've got a sabbatical year, and in Hebrew this can be a Shemitah year. And this happens, like I said, every seven years. And then we have the, the jubilee, which in Hebrew it's um, the Yovel. And this happens every 50 years. So a few years may have the Scriptures Bible. You won't see jubilee, it'll be Yovel in there, okay? <clears throat> And the difference between the Jubilee and the sabbatical is that in the Jubilee, you actually have two extra benefits, okay? And one of them being land sold to ancestral owners during the Jubilee here, okay? So if you had a family and you had to sell because you were poor, it would return back to you in the Jubilee year. And then the second benefit of the Jubilee opposed to the sabbat uh, sabbatical is that debts are released for all inhabitants, okay, including the strangers. In Deuteronomy 15.3, we get a little bit more about the sabbatical and it says that you can release debts, to you, you will release debts to brothers, but not to strangers, okay? But in the, in as we're about to read, in the Jubilee, all debts for strangers are released, okay? Everyone in the land, all inhabitants in the land, okay? So we got that. So we got a little bit of a difference between the two, just so you know as, as we're going to get into the Torah portion reading. Um, so we're going to go from chapters, uh, tw chapter 25, verse 1. I'm going to hand it back over to Tommy, and we'll just do eight verses, please, brother, when you're ready. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. 
You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man, and the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock and the beasts that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so as we've just read about the blessings there of the sabbatical year, it's um, it, it's beautiful. It's, it's almost like a mini jubilee. Like I said, it hasn't got some of the um, blessings that come with a jubilee. Um, when, when we think about this sabbatical year, what we've got to realise is, is that if we're letting the ground um, grow fallow, if we're letting them overgrow, that also means that we're not going to be using the animals as much. So it's not just a rest for the earth. It's also a rest for the animals too. Okay. So it's a year of Shabbat for creation and wildlife every seven years. And there's some Edenic um, parallels in this pointing back to the Garden of Eden. And what I was trying to draw from this, what I was trying to glean from this is that in the Garden of Eden, we see that um, Adam was dwelling with all creation and it wasn't until he fell, it wasn't until he was cursed, he had to toil the ground, wasn't it? So it makes me think what the Garden of Eden would have looked like. Would it have looked quite fallow? Would it looked a bit overgrown? Um, I don't know. Um, because he wouldn't, of course, he was, he was told to tend to the garden, but he wouldn't have to, to reap from the soil as, as, as much. And also that would then mean, in turn, like I just said, the animals wouldn't be under um, the burden of man. So, so there would be more of a, a, a mutual respect there. And just a few scriptures in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, we read, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Okay, this is the curse given at the fall. And um, we also read, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your bread. So since the fall there was a, there was a harsh toiling that took place. And the animals and creation also felt this on top of it. And in Noah's journey, when he came out the ark, um, God said to Noah, the fear and dread of you will fall on every living creature on the earth, okay? Every bird of the air, every creature that crawls on the ground and all the fish of the sea, they are delivered into your hands. So we see man, man's um, disobedience have an effect on the entire creation. But what I love about this commandment is, what I love about this blessing is what we've just read there. It says in verse six, whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year shall be for you, for yourself, your, ma your manservant, your maidservant, your hired hand or a foreigner who stays with you and for your livestock and wild animals in your land. All its growth may serve as food. So it's, it's, it's almost leveling the playing field here. It's saying, look, you've got your maidservants, you've got your manservants, you've even got your animals. It's not, the food isn't just gonna be for you where you can store it away and have it all to yourself. It's like, look, this is a, this is a tiny little glimpse here of the Garden of Eden, okay? And it gives us a little bit of an insight because as they was traveling through the wilderness, they had the manna and the quail, didn't they, from heaven? And they would just gather what they could for that day. So this commandment we've got to remember is that it's only for when they go into the land. So they're not quite in the land yet, but it, when they do get in the land, it's like, look, I'm going to remind you that at a time when you was in the wilderness, you could only gather every single, you know, um, for, for the day that you was um, required to, required to eat on that day. So it's, it's interesting really um, how we see the Father instituting this to make Israel remember. Okay, that's what a lot of these commandments are about. They're making, making Israel remember um, where they come from. Okay, so the earth, animals and man all have a respite during this sabbatical year, giving a prophetic glimpse of what is to come when Yeshua returns. Don't get me wrong, it's not quite as good when Yeshua returns. You still could work on a sabbatical year, but if you was a farmer or if you was, um, you know, using animals, it will be a slight glimpse, okay? It's not the complete picture, it's just a shadow. And, it, and it's a shadow of how it's going to return back to how it was before the fall, okay? And we've drawn parallels in the past on how the millennial kingdom is the seventh day, the day after the 6,000 year, and this, uh, the sabbatical year being the seventh year here. So we, we draw parallels on that on the past. So that, th there's some of the blessings of the sabbatical year, and we're going to keep reading now um, the Torah portion because we're going to get into the Jubilee, okay? So it keeps going. 
So um, the seventh year is like a, a hope and an expectation as mm, well, isn't it? Yeah. As you said, it's a shadow. So we've got like a prophetic picture being drawn up of look, this is going to wow. come, this is going to come. It's seven, it's seven, it's seven. It's his signature, isn't it? Mm. So we get that hope and expectation of like a millennium reign as well. There, you know what I mean? So yeah, beautiful. I couldn't agree more. Um, and and the, and the jubilee um, unpacks that even further. So we'll we'll keep going. So we, can we go from um, 25 verse 8 please to 22 Tom when you're ready and you shall count seven sabbaths of years for yourself seven times seven years and the time of the seven sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years then you shall cause the trumpets of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap or grow of its own accord, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat its produce from the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. And if you sell anything to your neighbour or buy from your neighbour's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbour. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. Excuse me. I'll read that again. According to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your neighbour. And according to the number of years of crops, he shall sell to you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price. And according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number of years of the crops. Therefore, you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God. For I am the Lord your God. So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them. And you will dwell in the land in safety. Then the land will yield its fruit and you'll eat your fill and dwell there in safety. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce? Then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year. Until its produce comes in, you shall eat of the old harvest. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> you know, so we have the Jubilee. Um, talking to us there through scripture and as I mentioned in Hebrew it's Yovel um, <clears throat> and Yovel can actually also mean the shofar okay you may have heard this before and we see here um, the, the year of jubilee begins at the day of atonement doesn't it so they would blow the shofar across the land doo -doo -doo -doo. everyone would be like it's the jubilee <laughs> hallelujah we get a year off work <laughs> what's that sorry I know, wow, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, see, it's not until we forget that this is actually a historical document. We forget that, like, we've got to put ourselves in these scenarios and think, what would this be like to live in? It would be incredible, wouldn't it? I mean, like, everyone, like I say, everyone goes mad off the Queen's Jubilee. What's a day? The pubs are full. Everyone's got the tops off in the sun and having a few beers. But this would be like a full year's <laughs> party for a year, you know, and... Um, just a few pointers. I've got a little a few pointers about the Jubilee here, just breaking down what we've just read, okay? So first point number one, the Jubilee, it's about separation, okay? It's a hallowed year. This year is to be treated differently from the previous 49 years, okay? It is a holy or set apart year unto the Lord like no other year, okay? And it is also to be holy for you, to be set apart for you. As I said, it begins on a day of atonement and that's the most um, holy day of the year and some people believe the day of atonement is actually a picture of judgment day okay point number two it's a proclamation of liberty we've looked at how this ties in with debts being free animals resting land resting it's about the multiplication of time okay we count seven years seven times which gives us 49 and the 50th year being the jubilee Okay, so it's a greater picture of what we're actually doing now. Okay, we're counting the omen now, aren't we? But you know what day are we on? Come on, come on, come on, 28. Yeah, that's the one. 
Um, we're counting the omen now until um, Pentecost, and um, which which is an appointed time, isn't it? So the jubilee is an appointed time, and what what is what is the appointed time? It's an appointment, mate. Okay, you don't want to miss your appointment. <laughs> okay, God's got an appointment with you, it's, so. We, we, this is important, okay? We, we don't want to miss our appointment with the Most High. Point number four, it's about all the inhabitants of Israel, okay? This time, including the strangers, okay? So, so it, it, it's inclusive of everyone. And point number five, we read, return every man unto his possession and his family, okay? So this stresses the importance of family and it's emphasising um how important the family home is and how important inheritance is a family receives, okay? So it's a, it's a potent time. It's a potent time that's taking place here. And I just want to break down here now the, the word jubilee, okay, in Hebrew. So I've got on the screen here, we've got jubilee and it's the Strong's H3104. And it can mean, as we say, Yovel. And if we break down the four words, that this is made up of. We, we get a little bit of a prophetic message here, okay? So let's have a little read. So we have the, um, the Yod, the Yod, sorry, and it's hand, work, deed, that's what it can mean, okay? And usually this is used in an action form or an action by hand. Sometimes it can even mean a divine action. You know, we've got to remember all throughout the Bible, it was the right hand of God. Stretch out your right hand. We know the right hand of God is Yeshua. And then the next letter we have is the Vav, and this is nail hook connection. Okay, this is what it means in the in the in the paleo. We, we can we can look at it and we can see the different meanings. And this can mean join together, bind, or create a connection. Okay. And then the next letter we have is the bait. As Tommy mentioned earlier, it can mean house, and it can also mean a dwelling place. It can mean family, and in some uh, translations, it can also mean the sun as well. Okay. And then the last letter we have is the lamed. And Joe's covered the Lamed in the past brilliantly. We should know what this one is. It's the goad, isn't it? It's the staff. It's the control. Okay? Displaying authority. Displaying control. So, if we put all these words together, what do we get? Okay? What do we get? We get a divine deed or hand that joins, binds together a family, a house, or a dwelling place, gaining direction, authority, and control. Okay? So, this is the potency of the Jubilee. Okay, but what does this mean to us? Okay, what does this mean to us? Well, when our hearts are compelled to compete the appointed times, the appointments, it's a divine action from God, from the hand of God, Yeshua, binding together a spiritual family, a spiritual home, a dwelling place, and us gaining direction and authority um, and, and ultimately control of sin through Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay, so we get direction. We get authority in, by Yeshua's name and, and, and he gives us the power to overcome um, Hasatan, to overcome the adversary, okay? And the scripture itself, um, scriptures itself confirms this hidden meaning, okay? In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, we get this um, scripture and it says, You yourselves also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, hallelujah. Okay, so let's break this down. Let's break this first. Peter down using the Jubilee. We see the Yud, which is action, okay? What's the action we're being built? Being built by who? By God. Unless the Lord builds the house. What is it? The labour in vain who build it, okay? The labourers. Um, in vain who um, um, who build it and then we have the vav okay which is connection the individual living stones are connected to make a spiritual house then we have the bait which is the spiritual house itself the accumulation of the stones and then we have the lamed which is direction authority which is the holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to god through yeshua's name okay so we see it there we see the jubilee we have all experienced a jubilee in our life in this room okay we have we all have i'm looking around every single one of us have experienced liberation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in 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 this room and the divine deed for us was yeshua's crucifixion that binds us together a house or dwelling place gaining direction 
authority and control. The power of Christ in us to walk in his ways in spirit and in truth. Did you want to say something there, brother? No, no, just listen. No. Hallelujah. 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 So as the Jubilee comes around only once every 50 years, most people would only really reap its full benefit in working adulthood once a lifetime. Okay, think about it. You know, if you was maybe 10 years old, you wouldn't next see the Jubilee till you was like 60. If you was born before the Jubilee, you might, it might land when you're 25. You know, you wouldn't re you'd only really benefit it once in a lifetime, okay? And I like to look at that how we experience just one touch from our Yeshua, one touch from our King, and that changes everything, doesn't it? Yeshua is our Jubilee. Yeshua is our liberty that changes us forever. We only got to look around the room and to see that, you know, all of us here are sitting in this room from different parts of the world, different backgrounds, different parts of the country, different cultures, and he's building his house with us. And with that, we're going to take a quick break or we're going to go for lunch. And in part two, we're going to look at how Yeshua actually read from the scroll of Isaiah referring to the Jubilee year. And we will look at how observing Shabbat and the Jubilee is an act of faith. Okay? So we'll take a quick break there. Bless you, Shalom. Bless you, Bless So in the first part, we looked at um, the, the word itself, didn't we? We broke it up, um, the, the word Jubilee in, 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 from the Hebrew, and we've seen that prophetic message. And I actually believe Yeshua's ministry was during the year of Jubilee, okay? And we're gonna have a look at this in the scriptures now. So if we can all turn to Luke, and it's chapter four, verse 16, okay? it'd be great for us to read this one. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, mm -hmm. to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. <clears throat> and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, powerful, powerful. Mm -hmm. The acceptable year of the Lord, I believe, is the jubilee. This is what he's talking about here. He says to proclaim liberty. I believe his ministry, when he came on the earth, was during that time frame. Okay, and Yeshua curiously doesn't finish the rest of the verse in Isaiah, does he? No. The rest of the verse, and and this was actually, this was really frowned upon in that time because people, <coughs> the, the, the Sanhedrin's, the people of that time would say, no, if you were to start a verse, you'd have to finish it. So he'd done something against the traditions of men. And he ended when he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book, okay? But if we keep reading on, if we go and find where he was actually reading from in Isaiah, what does he say? And the day of vengeance of our God, okay? So he stopped because I believe that jubilee, the jubilee where he came the first time, it was not yet the jubilee for him to bring about vengeance. He came first as the lamp of liberty with his death, burial, resurrection and ascension. And he will come back as the lion with vengeance to go to war with wickedness. Okay. Mm. You know, just imagine him that sitting out in the synagogue today. The scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Powerful. <laughs> Powerful. Mic drop moment. Yeah. <laughs> and... 
we spoke about in the first half how amazing the Jubilee year is, okay? And it's quite interesting because the Jews actually don't keep the Jubilee year anymore. They keep the sabbatical. And they try their best to keep the sabbatical, but this is a commandment that unfortunately isn't practised in this world anymore. And a lot of people debate over this of when they believe the Jubilee years and try and calculate because you think if you have the Jubilee, it might be when he's going to return. I personally do believe he's going to return on a Jubilee. And we cannot fully observe the commandments anyway, because as Joe was saying before we broke up, we, we don't really have any physical land that we can reclaim while we're here. We can't really fully keep this commandment. But I believe we've already observed it in a spiritual sense and we will observe it in its fullest when he returns. I believe Yeshua is going to return on a jubilee for those who put their trust in wealth. When he returns, will feel like they've lost material goods because um, when, when he comes back, these goods are going to be burnt up by fire, okay? Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to make this connection is, is that it's going to be similar to how those who used to keep the jubilee in the past, who had the most land possession, who had the most servants who had, who had the most business they had to return all this land to the ancestral owners every 50 years okay so for a rich man he may lose his bond servants because servants was free in that time so he'd lose his workers he could potentially lose real estate um, um, and, and and henceforth potential business because you'd imagine going up to where like a tesco or a walmart is and being Hey, look, I know this Tesco's been here for the past, like, 30 years, but sorry, mate, it's going to have to go. Um, I've, got, I've got a claim. I've got an ancestor. My ancestors claim this land. This is, this is actually my family's home. We see, like, Amazon, you know, and, and, and I remember growing up in Liverpool. I grew up in the area of Wavertree, and we used to have little fruit and veg shops and, 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 and all these little shops. And the next thing, and Asda popped up, then an Aldi, yeah. and before we knew it, okay, all, these, the little, all yeah. these little shops just, yeah. just, just, yeah. just died. Mm. And, um, so, you know, could you imagine tearing up and saying, I know you've had a superstore built here for like the past 30 years and that you've monopolised the land, but it's the Jubilee. My family has come to claim this land. And although we did sell it in poverty, we've come to claim it. Could you imagine that? It'd be beautiful. So for the rich man, the great coming Jubilee, may not be as welcomed as we was all cheering before on the first part. Mm. And to see this in practice, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. Okay? Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. All right, so this is a, this is a question that I would, I would be asking Yeshua. You know, how, do you, how can one get into the kingdom of heaven? You know, he was, he was sat here at the time when he, when he came. You know, that would be one of the questions on your list to ask, wouldn't it? And this is his response. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Yeshua looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Yeshua said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Okay, powerful scripture again. Mm -hmm. And we read here about the eye of the needle, okay? That it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God okay and this eye of the needle was actually a narrow gateway in Jerusalem since camels were heavily loaded with goods and its rider they would have to be unloaded in order to pass through 
the eye of the needle. Therefore, the, anal the, the um, analogy is that a rich man would have to unload his material possessions in order to enter heaven. Okay? And when I've always read that, I thought it was just like a, a little needle, then a camel would have to fit through that. Mm -hmm. I have the needle, but it's, it's, it's a gateway into a city. Mm -hmm. And I believe the Israelites was meant to experience this in, not, 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 as, not as a grand way, it's a, it's a type and shadow, but I believe those who are wealthy was meant to experience the eye of the needle every 50 years, okay? Of course, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get rid of all their possessions, but you would leave behind workers, you would leave behind land, counting down um, when, when you come into that new cycle of 50 years, okay? And those who could not leave their material possessions with a pure heart would not be welcoming that jubilee, would they? Or at very least, they wouldn't be as excited as, as, as what someone who, who was in, in a um, position of poverty. When the great... Sorry, what? It's humbling. It's humbling, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. It's, it's, it's humbling. Um, and when the great jubilee comes... We have to give back more than our possessions. This is what Yeshua is saying here. Yeshua elevates this and says, when Peter says to him, he says, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? You know, he's, he, he elevates it to another position, doesn't he? He doesn't only say, who has left houses? He also says family as well. Look, mm -hmm. you've got to choose me over your family here. You know, you've got to choose. This is the only way. This is to actually <laughs> save your family. <laughs> And that's how I love in, in that in, in part one how we looked at the sabbatical year and it's like you can all eat the fruit of the land, even your animals, you know, even your animals will be eating the same um, food and it will be all be left ground. So we're gonna be looking at now um, a little bit deeper into this, into what Yeshua said here, okay? Because he said, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, okay? So we're gonna look at this word regeneration in the Greek, okay? It's the strongs. 3824, and I'm going to try my best with this one. It's palagenesia. Nice. Palagenesia. And the outline of biblical usage for this is new birth, reproduction, renewal, recreation, uh, regeneration. And the second outline of biblical usage is the renewal of the world to take place after its destruction by fire. Okay? So when Yeshua is saying that in the regeneration, it's very evident he's speaking about you know the afterlife, the world to come, okay, after. Um, after the the, the, um, the end of this age and interestingly I was just meditating a bit more on the other biblical usage because we, we don't we don't have um, the book of Matthew in Hebrew we just have it in Greek so I was just looking at the different biblical outline uses of, of, of this word and what we see here is there's two other uses for this word I want to read this and it's because the penny's just going to drop okay and the third use of this word it's got noted here in the Blue Letter Bible. The signal and glorious change of all things in heaven and earth for the better. That restoration of the primal and perfect condition of things which existed before the fall of our first parents. Which the Jews look for in a connection with the advent of the Messiah and which Christians expect in connection with the visible return of Yeshua from heaven. Okay, that to me is speaking everything what we've just learned about Jubilee, a pre-fall world, an Edenic state, a fallow world, okay? Biblical outline usage number four, restoration to rank and fortune on his recall from exile, okay? So this is this is another meaning what this regeneration can, 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 can um, be hinting at here. Restoration to rank and fortune on his recall from exile. What did we just learn about the Jubilee? It's a restoration of God's people in a priestly role, an ingathering, a building of a spiritual home, okay? Outline biblical usage number five, the restoration of the Jewish nation after exile, okay? So we're seeing here, the great Jubilee that we are gonna have is gonna gather the 10 exiled tribes and Judah, and it's gonna be restored as one, okay? So this is this is how I see this. What's this regeneration? Okay. And we read later on in the scripture, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, mm -hmm. judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, powerful, powerful stuff. I think that's one of the reasons, at least one of them, made why our <coughs> Jewish brothers and sisters don't observe the Jubilee year anymore. Because mm, okay. when we read the scriptures, it says, all who live on the land 
Yeah. And this in with all its road types and running around at the moment. Yeah. That's what it's, that's I, came, I came across that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what yeah. it is, bro. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, 2022 to 2023 is the Jewish um, Shemitah year, the seven cycle. So the mm. next seven cycle um, is going to be, I think it's like 28, 29. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, I think the last Jubilee year would have been 21, 22. Really, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But again, you know, is this just the traditions that have been passed down or is this actually the, the correct Shemitah? I, I don't know. I don't know myself personally i don't know if we can go remember that the mm. our, our, our jewish brothers and sisters the hebrews they did go into exile for a long period of time we don't know how much they picked up while in exile we don't know if they've lost the calendar what we brought in so we just we've just got to meditate on the word pray pray about it and, and come to our own conclusions you know i, I I'm, I'm long done with setting the doomsday clock okay mm. <laughs> i've seen that many doomsday clocks on youtube um I've, you know, that's it, I'm done with it. <laughs> so, in context, I believe this parable speaks of his return on a jubilee, okay? This is what I think this regeneration is getting at here, okay? The restoration of a Jewish nation after exile, the restoration of a rank and fortune on his recall from exile, okay? And Judgment Day, I believe, is drawing the Day of Atonement. We read... Uh, um, in, in, in chapter 25, the shofar will be blown. Yovel in Hebrew was also interchangeable with the ram's horn, the shofar. And curiously, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we read, In an instant, in the, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and perish, perishable and will be changed. So could this be the link here? We've got the day of trumpets and we've got atonement. Could it? You know, we, we, we've got to pay attention to these times, uh, these times and seasons. This is why Yah um, put them in. We're never going to find out when he's going to return by going off the Easter Bunny or, or Father Christmas. We've got to go off in his appointed times, okay? His appointments, as I said on the first half. Just so, the idea of being transformed and changed. Mm. The word that you gave there in Greek, it's got Genesis in it. Wow. If you, if you just go back and pronounce it again. Again, you know, it's up. go on, you've got it. <laughs> Palagenesia. Pa 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 it's got a G E N E S I A. Wow. It's yeah. like got the Genesis in there. It has. Wow, I didn't see that. That's yeah, brilliant. It's, it's like it's like again, again, isn't it? It's it like is, the beginning yeah. again. Wow. And when Paul says in the moment <laughs> in the twinkle of an eye at the sound of the last show from that shall be raised in corruptible, we shall be transformed. You know, it's that it's that it's that transformation again, isn't it? Like yeah. That, that regeneration, so to speak, as I've wow. just been getting that. It's beautiful, bro, and I just love how the biblical outline you should stay. It just hits the nail on the head, doesn't it? It's that Edenic state going back there, um, going back to the land that's fallow, okay? That isn't being, you know, raped essentially by mankind. So, just touching back now on the Day of Atonement, which is the most set apart day of the year, it was actually a day where um, you would see if Israel was going to be pardoned for the sins of, for the year, and we've covered this. Uh, quite recently and there's a, there's a great duality that goes on on the day of atonement because you see one goat that's sacrificed in a temple one that's released as a zeal in the wilderness and it's it's like wow you, you see it here you see in this judgment day you see and you see in the two sides you see in the kingdom of light the kingdom of darkness and um, taking place so for me it makes perfect sense for yeshua to be coming back or to be judging on the jubilee on the day of atonement and it's like there's no lukewarm there's no gray area it's obvious. King of darkness, king of light. Um, so powerful. Yeah, I would totally agree. I would. I believe that it is going to be on a jubilee. In, so, in Psalm 24, verse 1, it says that the entire world is Yahweh's and all its contents, everything is his. He founded the waters and filled it with the filled, He founded the ocean and filled it with water. Wow. Yeah. So he's actually going to claim back what's his. Wow. So it goes back to the original owner Beautiful. on Jubilee. Yeah, 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 and that's yeah. when he's going to sit on the throne. Oh, fantastic. And it's going to be all his. He's coming back to take what's his, even wow. his own possession, which is his bride. You see, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. you know, just as the woman was yeah. deceived and eaten by the serpent, just as the just as the church when it, Israel went into captivity and the church fell into bondage, he's coming back to take what is right. Mm. 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 Oh. When the Jubilee comes, we must be ready to inherit, but we also must be ready to let go. Because interestingly, there's a saying, isn't there? More things, more problems, okay? More possessions, more responsibilities. The Jubilee was more of a blessing to those who were in a position of poverty 
for them, they will be gaining their home. Yeah. Um, and and they had to, they ultimately had to sell when he was when he was when he was down in poverty, and they could even be regaining back their life as well. Because all and even a family, because they might have to sell themselves, they might have had to sell the family if it was dire circumstances. Because he was just broke, he was bankrupt. It was either that or get took t- t- out by the surrounding nations, which are like Canaanites and bloodthirsty. So, so it was an act of mercy to do this. Um, and and so the, the jubilee will be a, a town of families coming back together, and it will be more of a blessing for those in poverty. And if only the rich man knew how much he was about to inherit, okay? Mm -hmm. The loss of his treasures in comparison to eternal life is nothing, is it? Mm -hmm. You know, how many things you see on on the the, the TV, on on the internet, keep young, keep fit. Everyone wants wants eternal life, don't they? But they're all going through different Mm -hmm. means of trying to attain it. (laughs) And it's just so simple, it's so simple. But we, we can't point at the rich man, you know, because a lot of us have actually been that rich man, okay? A lot of us have been that rich man that we're reading about in the gospel. And why? Well, we know that the kingdom of God can be likened to the Sabbath, okay, the seventh day. And you see, a lot of us in this room at one point didn't actually understand the value of the Sabbath. And kept on working on it because we didn't want to lose out on finances, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, myself included, when I first come into this walk, I was like, okay, I can make it every other Sabbath, you know, and... I'll have a word with me boss and I told me boss I can only work one Saturday. But that was just a lack of understanding on my half, okay? I didn't understand or trust in the divine blessing that God will bring if we give him the Sabbath. Just as how the Israelites were told not to collect manna or quail on the Sabbath day. So we must trust in our Father to provide for us, even if we don't work on a Saturday. And for those who kept the Jubilee or the sabbatical year, it was initially an act of faith. He may think he would be losing out because he couldn't work in the seventh year, but as we've read, there's actually a blessing in being obedient to Yah. He promises he's going to bless us to make the produce last even in the eighth and the ninth year, okay? So we must be ready to let go. We must be ready to unload our riches, like the camel rider trying to enter into Jerusalem and step into the greater blessing of what is to come. There's an act of faith required to observe the Jubilee, just as there's an act of faith to observe the weekly Sabbath. There's a reason why he keeps the pattern of sevens. It's all pointing to each other. If we trust him on the sixth day, he will bless us. And it's funny because the Parsha ends with two verses in chapter 26, okay? So in chapter 26, we just have two verses, and then bang, it ends. And we're just going to read them now. So Leviticus 26, (coughs) we're going to go from verse 1. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. Verse 2. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Okay, so he, he punctuates the importance of his appointed times and not making idols in replacement. He punctuates not making a replacement worship system, ultimately putting anything before his Sabbaths, okay? It's curious because we get this like jubilee, this redemption, and then we get this instruction about idolatry. And it's like, it's like uh, married in with Sabbath, which is yeah. curious as well, you know, because... Together, yeah. The Sabbath is what identifies Israel. You know, the nations don't murder, they don't steal. There's people out there that marry and give in marriage, but it's the Sabbath that's the sign between Mm -hmm. God and Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's what sets us apart from going after nothing else other than him. Because there's other religions out there that say don't murder, don't steal. And there's Mm -hmm. other so-called gods out there that say don't do harm, don't do this. But it's the one true God that institutes the Sabbath which is associated with everything we've just read in the Shemitah and the Yovel. Yeah. So he puts that in there. It's like, look, this is my signature. This is Yehovah here. Mm, I also want to say that, um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's this instruction not to make an idol, and it says, don't do, the, don't do this and bow down to it in the land. Again, we know that all these instructions were land grants again. Um, but this word is Haaretz, but it can mean territory, dwell in place, and it can also be the place where we worship the Lord. 
So it's an instruction as well that you know we see a lot of idolatry that could be taking place in a lot of mainstream churches, and I'm not to point the finger, but when they elevate certain things in these in the Hatteret, in the place of, of worship or in the territory, in the land where they're meant to be meeting at one with God, though people say, Well, I've never bowed down to a Christmas tree, or I've never like bowed down to an Easter bunny. But you, it's 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 been brought in. It's been brought into that territory and that occupation, and that is forbidden, mm. right? So what I want to say is, though people say, "Well, that's not idolatry," you know, I've never bowed down to it. Well, actually, it is in accordance with the word because mm. it's a substitution, and it's been brought in. So you don't even need to bow down to it. Don't bring it in, yeah. you know. Don't bring it into that territory or that occupation because mm. then it can be deemed as idolatry. Mm. Idolatry is the substitution of 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 God, isn't it? It's replacement, yeah. it's replacement, you know, so we don't want to replace Yah's feasts with the, the pagan feasts of the world because I believe that it can be seen as idolatry. Yeah. And we have experienced the first part of this blessing of the Jubilee. Why? We may not experience the fullness of it, but we have experienced the full first part. And why is this? Because our debts have actually been forgiven by Yeshua. Okay. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait. 50 years for our debts to be forgiven. Okay, let's read 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9. I'll, I'll just read these out. And it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, we actually learn in the word that sin is debt. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. He forgave us all our trespasses, having cancelled the debt ascribed to us in the decrees that stood against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, we are no longer under the law because our debt has been paid for, but then we don't abuse grace and become lawless. We are thankful for our debts that have been paid free of charge by Yeshua, and in honour of that, we observe the law to the best of our ability. We've just got a few closing points now, and we read in the latter half of this portion, so Leviticus chapter, chapter 25, verse 47, and we read... Now, if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you, or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his uncle's sons may redeem him, or anyone who is near of kin to him and his family may redeem him, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. The beauty of Yeshua coming as our personal jubilee, our personal liberation, is that our debts can be forgiven at any time. We no longer have to wait seven years or the 50. Our kinsman, our close relative, has come and paid the price for us to be redeemed, so we are no longer a, a slave to sin. Our personal debts can be forgiven at any time by Yeshua. And Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, it, it just states this beautifully and it just it just fits so well um of, of of this torah portion of being ransomed and it's matthew chapter 20 verse 28 and it goes like this just as the son of man did not come to be saved but to save and to give his life as ransom for many okay another translation like the son of man who did not come to be saved but to save and to give his life to redeem many people okay the way you'll be like, oh, look, bro, I'm really broke. I've had to sell myself into slavery. Get in touch with me, uncle. He's got a bit of money. Please come and redeem me. I'm, you know, I'm in slavery. Yeah, you know, I just want to be redeemed. I've, I've done four years and I can't do the seven. It's a bit, it's a bit too much. Uh, but, but in our case, Yeshua's come and he's been like, you're redeemed. You're redeemed, my son. Okay. And we've been freed to serve. And how do we know this? Because in the last verse in chapter 25, this is what we read. For the Israelites are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so we've just, we've just read all these laws about being redeemed as a servant and about, you know, it being in servitude to someone. But then God just says, but you're still a servant for the Israelites are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. So what we've got to realise is, is that we are no longer a slave to man, we are no longer a slave to the world, but we are always going to be in servitude to the Most High. And who wouldn't want to be? Who wouldn't want to be after we've read about his characteristics, about this beautiful 
Jubilee, which is a prophetic message, and it's going to come. See, we were bought at a price, as it says, whom I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You could even say bought there. <laughs> we are to be in servitude to the Most High. The Jubilee may release you from a worldly servitude, but verse 35 reminds Israel at the end of the Parsha, they have a calling on their lives, okay? And Paul himself, what did he say? What did he call himself? He actually bond called servant. himself a bond servant, a slave, a slave to Messiah. So the return of Yeshua, the great jubilee, all creation will be looking forward to it, even the strangers. And our land inheritance will be the heavenly Jerusalem. Just like the camel rider with his treasures, let's be prepared to unload and go even further and unload our debts, our trespasses against each other, things we have against our, our brother, our unforgiveness. Let's strive to enter the narrow gate. Let's strive to enter the eye of the needle, to enter into the new Jerusalem. And we're just going to end now on Revelation reading about the new Jerusalem. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are faithful and true. And he told me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give freely from the spring of the water of life. The one who overcomes will inherit all things, okay? He will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. In reality, there is nothing more precious than the blood of Yeshua. Acting out in faith and following him, walking in his ways, observing the Sabbath, is a priceless gift no money can buy, and allows our Father to ultimately bless us. Through accepting the common jubilee, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain, making us the richest nation on earth, rich in everlasting life. And with that, we'll come to an end of Torah portion. Baha. Bless you.